We have two online courses, our eight-week essential foundations and advanced concepts that is starting today, and our live course. If you have taken our eight-week online course, Essential Foundations, you are eligible to take advanced concepts. Advanced concepts starts today. In that course, we take all of the foundational knowledge that we built with Essential Foundations and we apply it to different complex patient populations. So we go into neurological rehab, we talk about general medicine, we go into more advanced concepts in musculoskeletal rehab, as well as go into some of the business and marketing aspects of catering to an older adult demographic. So if you are interested, I think we only have one spot left for this cohort, but I hope you jump on because it's gonna be super fun. Okay. So I'm gonna try and not go on too much of a rant today, but the topic of my discussion for today is high intensity is a buzzword in Jerry PT. Over the last several years, you have seen a push. We have been one of the ones who have been trying to lead the charge in regards to trying to use constructs that were traditionally thought to only be applicable to a younger population and translate them into geriatric rehab and translate them in a way that is applicable to clinicians who are working in different settings. So what is going to be high intensity interval training for somebody who's a community dwelling older adult is gonna be very different, but still applicable to a person who is mostly wheelchair bound. Still possible, but we manipulate some of the variables. In the literature, there has been a push for studies to be evaluating some of these constructs. So these high intensity constructs. In cardiovascular rehabilitation, that is working at higher percentages of your VO2 max, approaching your VO2 max when it comes to intervals in high intensity interval training. High intensity resistance training is looking at higher loads. And this is where I start to get all sassy about this. So when you look at literature, and this is why it is so important that you do not just look at the abstract. I'm going to say this again. You should not just look at the abstract because you're going to see this study that says high intensity resistance training in frail older adults does the exact same as a standard exercise program. And you're like, oh, so maybe I don't need to be doing high intensity programming. I should just be working on a standard exercise program like I've always done and go about your day. You need to look at the methods. And so this is where I think as researchers, we need to do better because I could probably say there's maybe, maybe three, potentially four research studies out of hundreds that have been done in resistance training in older adults that are true to the word of doing high intensity. Let me explain. So when I look at the method section for an exercise program, there are a couple of things that I am looking for. Number one, I am looking to have a pretty clear idea of what you did in this exercise program. Oftentimes they say a combination of exercises for upper extremity, lower extremity, and give the rep range. That to me is not enough because if I'm a clinician who is looking to replicate this program, I'm not gonna be able to do that except have this general concept of what you did. And I'm not gonna be able to delineate if that aligns with what I'm traditionally doing in my practice or not. So that's number one. But two, if you see somebody whose high intensity program is three sets of eight to 12 at 60% of your one rep max, that is not high intensity. That is legitimately the bare minimum standard set out by the American College of Sports Medicine in order to drive some adaptation to strength training. The thing about that 
is that we are not, when you're in that 12 rep range, we are working on muscular endurance and hypertrophy. We are not looking at raw strength. And so the study then shows no statistically significant difference in the extensor strength pre post intervention. And I'm like, are we surprised by that? You're not actually looking at max strength. Maybe hypertrophy is going to gain to max raw strength, but we know that in order for individuals to be able to lift heavier loads, they have to be exposed to heavier loads. So that's number one. So this high intensity is something that increases the likelihood that people are going to look at it. It increases potentially the likelihood that researchers are going to get funding for it, but you actually have to look at what they're characterizing high intensity as, because if it's not pushing into that 75% range, there might be an introduction two or three weeks in the program where they're trying to get people accustomed to strength training in general. That's fine, but you need to be working into these ranges. And if you are not, then you're not working at high intensity You're working at maybe moderate intensity. Number two is that if the paper is not objectively measuring in some capacity, and if you've heard me harp on this, you know that we need to be objectively measuring strength and that doesn't have to be day one, but using things like a sub max, like three rep or five rep max test, looking at volitional failure or pain as a voluntary reason for cutting the test early or using something like an AMRAP set to judge intensity is going to be super important in practice for us to be getting an idea of where their baseline level of strength is in order for us to make sure that we are not underdosing our exercise programs. The same is true in the research world. So if we are using a squat test and you're saying that you're working at 60 to 75% of your one rep max, but you have no idea what your patients who are taking this or participants who are taking this study are able to do, then how could you truly know that you are dosing them appropriately in order for you to drive adaptation and change? And so not only are you doing your own paper disservice because you're not giving the appropriate stimulus to drive change, we're, we're not necessarily studying what we think we're studying. And there's a large discongruency between what the literature is potentially saying and what some of the effects we could be seeing are. All right, that is number two. Number three is if you're not seeing any sort of indication for progression, then that person may have been using the exact same load for whatever length of study that they are using. So if it's a 12 week, 18, 24 week, and they aren't saying when after two weeks we increase by five pounds or when the client on a scale of RPE of zero to five or zero, sorry, zero to 10 said that it was five or less, then we progressed, then you have no idea if they're actually, again, just adapting to lower loads and not actually getting higher. And if you're taking that intensity and just adding volume, again, we are not in a high intensity resistance training protocol. We're getting more into a cardiovascular or endurance muscular hypertrophy protocol, which again is fine, but it just means that there are very few research studies that I'm seeing that I would truly say is a high intensity program for the older adults. And what that means is that it's translating into practice that these high intensity protocols may not be high intensity protocols. Maybe from a cardiovascular perspective, if we you know, use these hypertrophy rep ranges and we shorten the amount of rest in between sets, we can drive some cardiovascular adaptation, some muscular endurance and hypertrophy. But if your goal is to make it so that they can stand up, if it is a strength issue, then we cannot be using these three by 10 to 12 protocols. And that's on me as a researcher. Hi Jeff, hi Alex, you're hearing me rant. Um, and so as a researcher, I'm looking at these protocols. I'm right now working on my PhD dissertation where I am broad stroke looking at what the literature is saying and I'm looking at these protocols and I was like, these are not high intensity protocols. These are bare minimum driving muscular adaptation protocols. And so for somebody who is deconditioned, we're going to see what we call newbie gains. We're going to see somebody who is not exercising, start to exercise and see some of those beginning adaptations. But if we truly want to say that high intensity is superior or is not superior, we need to be testing what we're saying we're testing. So we need to be saying, okay, in these high intensity protocols, 
older adults in the high intensity group were working at 75 to 80 percent of their one rep max in a three to five rep range the lift more trial and one trial of in kettlebell training with older adults was potentially the only two that can come front of mind until my paper gets published. But when I was looking at my research papers, I had a protocol that was three sets of 10 to 12 in isolation, um, lower extremity, upper extremity exercises, and I compared it to three sets of three to five using barbells, using strength training, and individuals who are at risk for developing frailty, who had some mild cognitive impairment, who had an on average of four different chronic conditions, which would be fairly similar to a lot of the clients that you would be seeing in your day-to-day -day practice working in geriatrics. And so we need to start being critical of the literature that we are looking at, and we need to decide what protocol works best for us. There's so many system barriers, and that is a whole other rant and talk, but I think in the world of geriatrics, the use of the word high intensity has been something that has driven us to get more grants and be able to do more exercise trials, but the execution of a true high intensity protocol is still missing. And there is still a lot of work to be done. And that's part of the reason why I did my PhD. Um, but we, we need to start being these individuals who, who are critical about what the research is saying and are going to look for the methods in the exercise protocol truly reflecting truly reflecting what we are hoping to drive change in our older adults. So if we are thinking that we are trying to drive change in absolute amount of strength so that we can avoid one rep max living, then we need to work in those three to five rep ranges. We need to be working on developing raw strength. We need to introduce to our clients the idea of what it feels like to lift something heavy and even that exposure can help at submax loads but if our literature base is not actually reflecting that it's hard to make evidence-informed decisions as a geriatric physical therapist because we are so we are taught that that we need to reflect what the literature is saying and i totally agree with that so we need to start pushing for more research trials that are truly evaluating high intensity. And that is something that has been going around in my mind. Thanks, Jeff, he's telling me to preach. It is so tough to not get on a soapbox about this, but it is so, so important that we recognize what it truly means to be high intensity in the resistance training protocol. And three sets of 12 at 60% is not high intensity. It is minimum dose to drive adaptation. And we know in those higher rep ranges, we are not driving absolute strength. We are driving muscular hypertrophy, motor control, endurance, totally applicable in a lot of settings. But if our goal is to get them stronger, we need to expose them to high intensity loads. And that load could be three pounds for our client who's deconditioned, but it's still high intensity. For some of my older adults, I have them deadlifting 70 pounds with cardiovascular compromise, multiple, orthopedic joint replacements, et cetera, et cetera. But it's possible and we need to be critical of the literature in this area so that we are not getting confused on what these terms mean. All right, coming slowly off my soapbox. I thought this was gonna be a shorter episode. I'm already at 14 minutes. It is all good. If you guys have any thoughts or comments on that, I would love to hear it. Um, this is something that I have a lot of conversations with my academic colleagues about um, because I think it's really important and it is hard sometimes because there is a lot more red tape and, and things involved in conducting research trials that is often not um, truly like a clinician who's not in this world is truly aware of. That's totally fine. Um, but it is an important construct for us to be thinking about in the research circles and then how do we provide knowledge translation opportunities to clinicians in order for them to see that, that literature. Alrighty, I am done. I am not ranting anymore. I hope you all have a wonderful Wednesday. It is already the middle of January. It is a couple of weeks into 2021. I feel like people are kind of a mixed bag of what they think this year is gonna bring, but that is okay. We are gonna be coming at you doing Jerry content every Wednesday. 
If you are interested, we have a couple of courses coming up in January and February. We are in Arkansas. We are in, um, where are we going? We're in South Carolina. We are in, oh my goodness. I think we're in Pennsylvania. I will post the link for all of our courses. I, I sometimes just get on a plane and go. Eventually, hopefully, I'll be able to get over this border. Um, so if you guys are interested in any of our live courses, I'll put the link underneath. Otherwise, have a wonderful Wednesday. Hopefully, we'll see some of you in advanced concepts, and we will talk more soon. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.